The candidates for November are set. I know Donald Trump's type. Between now and Election Day. We are not going back. A campaign season unfolding faster. Kamala Harris is not getting a promotion. Than any in recent history. Make America great again. Follow it all with new episodes every weekday on the NPR Politics Podcast. Are you enjoying this podcast? Well, you have KUOW members to thank for that. KUOW members make the trusted local journalism and storytelling you hear on this show possible. Become a member today and help support the production of this podcast. It only takes a minute. Make a donation at KUOW.org or follow the link in the show notes. And thanks. You're listening to Sound Side. I'm Libby Denkman. This November, Washington voters will be asked to weigh in on complicated policies like a capital gains tax and a long-term care fund. Maybe the most complex is the future of the Climate Commitment Act. An initiative on the November ballot seeks to repeal the key part of this 2021 law, the cap-and-invest system. It's essentially an auction for major polluters where companies can purchase carbon allowances, kind of like permission slips for emitting planet-warming carbon dioxide. There are a limited number of carbon allowances that the 100 or so largest companies in the state bid on. Over time, the state plans to reduce the number of allowances, in other words, lowering the cap on carbon pumped into the atmosphere. Supporters of the Climate Commitment Act, like Governor Jay Inslee, have an eye on the state's ambitious goal to be at net zero carbon by 2050. Now a brief word about the invest part of cap and invest. The state legislature is using the billions of dollars already generated by the carbon auctions to fund a selection of transportation projects, green infrastructure and environmental justice priorities. Conservative hedge fund manager Brian Haywood and his group Let's Go Washington are behind the measure to repeal the system. If Initiative 2117 passes, Washington's cap and invest system will go away and the state will be banned from putting in place a similar market based greenhouse gas reduction mechanism. So voters, the decision to keep or kill Washington's carbon marketplace is in your court. Over the next couple days, we'll hear from a supporter of the initiative to repeal the cap and trade system. Today, we welcome a defender of the Climate Commitment Act and its marketplace. I'm joined by Representative Joe Fitzgibbon. He is the state House Majority Leader. His district includes West Seattle, Vashon, and White Center. And he helped create the Climate Commitment Act, and he opposes Initiative 2117. Representative, thank you so much for being here. Welcome. Thank you, Libby. So to start, you want people to vote no on this measure, 2117. Make the elevator pitch about why Washingtonians should vote against this initiative and keep the cap and invest system. Yeah, thank you. So the effect of of, uh, Initiative 2117 is to uh, eliminate Washington's cap on greenhouse gas emissions and allow unlimited greenhouse gas emissions in Washington state. In doing so, it would also jeopardize funding for a lot of things that we really are counting on to make our state a better place, like... uh, construction of new ferries, new ferry terminals, uh, investments in preventing wildfires, in um, improving salmon habitat, in uh, removing the the fish passage barriers that prevent salmon from reaching their habitat and spawning, uh, investments in in air quality. We have a network of air quality monitoring stations to um, to, to let Washingtonians know how clean their air is or how dirty their air is uh, that this initiative would defund. Um, it would do all those things at the same time as allowing unlimited pollution in Washington state with, with absolute Absolutely no guarantee that would it, it would it would do what the proponents hope it would do, which is reduce the price of gas. We don't think there's any guarantee that that will happen, and so the the downsides are really enormous in terms of the investments in making our state a better place that would go away. Uh, but the upsides are really unclear and hard um, hard for me to see. We're going to get to the price of gas in just a moment, but you have spoken about problems with the Climate Mm -hmm. Commitment Act. The law wasn't perfect. That's a direct Joe Fitzgibbon quote. Um, What do you mean by that? What do you mean by that the law wasn't perfect? And the legislature has made some tweaks so far in this past session, like starting the process to combine the market with Quebec and uh, California. What else needs to change? Yeah, well, I I would love to say that... um the truth is, I don't. I don't know that we've passed a perfect law yet uh, in in the state of Washington. But I do think the Climate Commitment Act was a pretty good start. I think we did a pretty good job learning from other jurisdictions that have worked to reduce pollution um, using these tools. One thing that we know isn't working very well is the exemption for farm products uh, and their transportation on the roadways. Um, we intended when we passed the law to provide an exemption for fuel used to transport agricultural products to get them to market. Um, it that has not worked very well because it's pretty difficult to 
track what is the purpose of any individual tank fill that, um, you know, as a farmer filling up their vehicle to transport apples to the cold storage warehouse, or are they, um, you know, filling up to take their, their, um, you know, dogs to the dog wash that day, right? And we don't have an ability to track at that granular level that would be necessary for that implementation of that exemption to work effectively. What we did instead this year, recognizing that that exemption wasn't working very well, was to set up a system of payments to farmers based on their fuel use uh, to help farmers deal with the fact that the fuel prices have increased. We don't think that they've increased primarily due to the Climate Commitment Act, but they have been high, and we know that uh, fuel prices are a significant cost for farmers. So that's one thing that I know that we we need to spend more time on if uh, if we still have the Climate Commitment Act next year, is figuring out how to make sure that farmers um, are, are are made whole and that and that, that uh, exemption can transition into something that, that works more effectively for, uh, for people who are growing our food in our state. The rollout of the carbon marketplace appeared to go badly from myself, my layman's perspective. $1.8 billion in revenue was a big windfall for the state, but it was like four times what was predicted when the marketplace was set up, which says to me that the allowance prices were too high, that Washington's carbon reduction targets were too steep. They were steeper than California's were than when they first started out, for example. Do you agree that the launch was rocky and what happened? Yeah. So our, our reduction targets are very steep. We have steeper reduction targets than California. In part, that's because we got a later start than California. California started their program you know, ten, more than 10 years before we started ours. Um, and we do need to catch up in order to ensure that we, we achieve the reductions that, that scientists tell us we need and that the Paris Agreement tells us that we need to achieve um, as a state and as a nation. Um, allowance prices were high and volatile in the first year. Uh, I think that that's largely due to just growing. Any new program like this um, is going to have some growing pains. And there's no question in 2023, we saw uh, prices higher than I think were sustainable. Um, any solutions that we could have enacted in the 2024 session to try to bring down those prices, we were pretty much precluded from doing by the fact that there was already an initiative on the ballot um, or headed to the ballot that would um, you know, re- repeal the Climate Commitment Act altogether. W- this year, we've seen prices be much lower and more stable. I think that's largely due to the anticipation of a linked market with the California-Quebec market. We know that the bigger the market is for carbon allowances, the more stable the price is going to be. And we're already seeing that the price has both stabilized and been, been much lower. Um, initiative proponents argue, of course, that it's because companies are looking ahead and expecting a repeal so the demand is lower and that's what's causing the prices to go down just want to note that sure and and you know it's hard to hard to predict markets with any certainty but you know but i think that that there's a lot of that, that there's a reason i think that the washington prices and the california prices have converged i think that's an anticipation that in a few years we're going to have a linked market um so um well i think that the the prices were unusually volatile in that first year and unusually high. Um, I think we, we're we're moving to a place where the prices are um, in a place where they are predictable for those hundred largest emitters in our state, um, who are the folks who are um, responsible for complying with the act. Okay, let's get to gas prices because it's a huge part of this campaign for the initiative um, uh, supporters. Gas prices, um, according to Brian Haywood, have been part of what he calls a regressive gas tax. He calls the CCA and the marketplace a regressive gas tax, um, which hit lower income people hard um, by raising the price on heating, on you know driving to work, on all kinds of things like groceries. Um, and, you know, folks who are in the lower income bracket don't have the option of buying expensive electric cars. They have less fuel efficient cars, uh, by and large, older cars. Is this a regressive tax? What's your response to that? So it's a fee on the largest emitters in our state, the 100 largest emitters in our state. And that includes the oil refineries who are on the hook for the emissions from the combustion of their product. Um, uh, We don't know with any certainty because we don't have the visibility into how oil companies price their products, how much they have chosen to pass along their compliance costs to their customers. We believe they've they've probably passed along some of the compliance costs to their customers, but we don't think that they've passed on all of those costs um, because they're very wealthy profitable uh, multinational companies that you know have been able to absorb some of the compliance costs. Um, the question that we don't think the initiative answers is if the initiative passes and those compliance costs for those large oil refineries are eliminated, are all of those savings going to be passed along to drivers or are they going to be absorbed by shareholders and executives at those oil companies? Um, the uh, 
unfortunate truth is that Washington has always had higher gas prices than the rest of the country. And that was true uh, well before the Climate Commitment Act. The West Coast in general has higher gas prices than the rest of the country for a variety of reasons, including the fact that we just don't have um, a lot of pipelines connecting us to the rest of the nation. Um, The highest gas prices we've ever seen in Washington state were in the summer of 2022 before the Climate Commitment Act took effect. So gas is a very volatile commodity. um, And the fact that um, Washington has high gas prices, we don't think we've seen gas prices become uh, meaningfully higher than the rest of the country. If you look at the differential between Washington gas prices and the national average, it's about the same now as it was before the Climate Commitment Act took effect. But if you look at the comparison with Oregon, which we've traditionally been pretty close to Oregon in prices, as soon as the CCA takes effect in 2023, you do see a separation where Washington uh, jumps about 50 cents a gallon above Oregon's prices initially. Actually, um, right now we're at about 39 cents uh, over Oregon's prices. Did supporters in the first place, you know, we've heard time and time again that Governor Inslee saying that it would only affect pennies on the dollar. It wouldn't really affect gas prices much was misleading. Um, That's according to supporters of this initiative. Did supporters and folks who were passing the law undersell its effects on gas prices to uh, to people who live in Washington. Yeah, I think we've always been upfront about the fact that the largest emitters in our state, including the oil refineries who are on the, you know, who have the responsibility for the compliance costs for the combustion of their product, we're going to pay, um, we're going to have to go to the auctions to acquire allowances for, uh, to compensate for those emissions and their impacts on Washingtonians. I think we've always been clear about that. That's, that's how we knew, that's how we were able to, uh, pass a 2022 revenue package for transportation purposes that was predicated on the revenues from those auctions. So I think we've always known that and we've always been upfront about the fact that oil companies were going to pay those costs. But did you make it clear that people at the pump would pay those costs and that this was uh, a sacrifice in order to look at all of these climate priorities that, yeah, maybe a lot of people would say that's worth it, but maybe that choice was not clear at the time that the law was being passed? I don't think that we know now, nor did we know then what to what degree oil companies were going to pass along the costs to their customers, to what degree oil companies were going to absorb those costs. I think we still don't know that to this day. And that was one one of the reasons why you saw Governor Inslee push hard for a uh, a bill this legislative session that would have given the state more visibility into how um, oil companies do set their prices. Oil what happened com- to that? It failed. What, what? It, it, it didn't pass. It was very strongly opposed by the oil industry and it didn't have enough support to pass. Um, I do think that that if that if we're going to try to attribute, you know, what share of the costs of oil are due to, you know, re- refinery maintenance or the, um, you know, conflicts with Russia and Venezuela relative to our air quality regulations. Yeah, we, the we 2022 high that you mentioned was, you know, right after Russia invaded mm-hmm. Ukraine, for example. Sure. Right. And, and There's global issues happening that affect oil prices as well. Right. Whenever, you know, whenever we see conflict with Venezuela, whenever we see conflict with Iran, with, with Russia, we see oil prices spike. And this is one of the reasons why I think this is a commodity that with or without the Climate Commitment Act is always going to be expensive for Washingtonians. And that's why it's important that Washingtonians have better alternatives uh, than being reliant on this polluting, expensive, volatilely priced commodity. Another allegation from Let's Go Washington about the Climate Commitment Act is that it will not reduce greenhouse gas emissions, that it's designed solely to bring in revenue. Again, that this is a regressive tax and primarily about bringing in money for the state. The effects of the first carbon auctions are tough to track because we don't have data from the past five years. The most recent greenhouse gas emissions information from the state is from 2019, and emissions were going up that year. Do you have proof that this law is bringing down carbon emissions so far or that it will have an effect on emissions in Washington state? We do know that when you set a firm legal cap on emissions in our state and bring that cap down over time, that's going to reduce emissions. And we know that because we've used this same policy tool to solve other air pollution problems. This is how we solved the hole in the ozone layer. That was President Reagan and his EPA adopting an international treaty and then 
national regulations establishing a cap and trade program to phase out chlorofluorocarbons, the 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 chemical used in refrigerants that that caused the hole in the ozone layer. This is how George H. W. Bush signed into law the 1990 Clean Air Act amendments, which used a cap and trade system to bring down the emissions of uh, nitrogen oxides and sulfur oxides, the chemicals that cause acid rain. Um, we we know that this policy, we, this, the Reagan EPA also used cap and trade to phase out lead from gasoline. Um, that when you're transitioning a pollutant that's used in a lot of the economy um, out of existence, then it um, it makes sense to allow the emitters that can reduce their emissions the fastest to then um, sell their allowances to the emitters that that don't have the, the flexibility to reduce as quickly. And we know this is going to be a long process. We know that you know our, our targets go through 2050. So this is a multi-decade endeavor for us. But we know that when you set a firm legal cap on the emissions of a certain kind of pollutant and bring that cap down over time, that reduces pollution. We don't have 2023 emissions data yet. That was the first year the Climate Commitment Act was in effect. But I am confident that we are going to see uh, the effect of that cap coming down, as well as all the investments we're making in cleaner transportation and cleaner home heating uh, and cleaner electricity um, pay off uh, in the years to come. But the truth is we just we don't have the complete greenhouse gas inventory from 2023 yet. Um, and um, we didn't really start passing strong climate laws before the Climate Commitment Act until 2019. As we see those laws take effect, we are, you know, we're seeing huge investments in cleaner energy, including by our electric utilities, including by many of our oil refineries. Um, we're, you know, Puget Sound Energy saw a significant decrease in uh, demand for residential and commercial gas uh, last year. So uh, I think we will see all of those things comprehensively when we do get the greenhouse gas inventory for 2023, the first year in which the Climate Commitment Act was in effect. It seems so crazy to me that we have a five-year lag in data. I mean, we did reach out to the Department of Ecology, the State Department of Ecology, about this. Um, they say that the department is reliant on the EPA for emissions data, and that's uh, federal de- data is lagging, that this lag is pretty normal. Um, and they point it to some other um, metrics that they said indicate that there's a likely drop in GHG emissions, the greenhouse gas emissions. But, you know, again, we it would be really nice to have that inventory um, up to date. Let's talk about the projects that, mm-hmm. you know, is being funded by this cap and invest, the invest part of this program. Um, you and your colleagues passed a big transportation funding package called Move Ahead Washington in 2022. That allocated $5.4 billion from the CCA, the Climate Commitment Act, carbon auctions to carbon reducing initiatives like grants for public transit, new electrified ferries. You've mentioned that. What are the impacts on the state's transportation system if this law goes away? So I think one of the biggest and most most obvious, I think maybe the biggest impact would be the removal of the funding for our new ferries. We know how much our our, our ferry fleet is pretty old, um, and you know generally folks working in the maritime. You must hear that a little bit representing Vashon. I hear that a fair amount from from, from my constituents. <laughs> Has on anyone Vashon ever Memorial contacted Islands. you about that? Uh, once or twice, uh, probably already today. Um, <laughs> the. Uh, we still need to build those ferries, even if we don't have Climate Commitment Act dollars for them. I think there is the potential that it could slow down the delivery of those ferries. There's a high likelihood it's going to slow down the delivery of projects all across the state because we're going to have to move resources into making sure that the ferries get completed. Um, so I think whether we're whether we're talking about project delays or project cancellations, it's likely that uh projects of all kinds, including projects that aren't currently funded by the Climate Commitment Act, like highway projects, uh, will see delays or cancellations because um, we still have to complete some of the the, ba- the basic maintenance of our state system, including ferry terminal construction and uh, ferry vessel construction. We are talking to Todd Myers with the Washington Policy Center tomorrow, who has um, been a supporter of the initiative to repeal the Climate Commitment Act. And he says that it's disingenuous to point to the threat of losing highway funding Um, in the advertising for the No on 2117 campaign um, because there is a prohibition in the Climate Commitment Act from spending the auction, the carbon auction funds on things like highways and things that promote driving. Um, Is that misleading to say that we're going to lose funding for highways if the CCA goes away? I think it's misleading to suggest that we could somehow fund our ferry fleet out of existing gas tax revenues um, and that that wouldn't impact highway projects around the state. There's no way that you can take $600 million out of the motor vehicle uh, fund, which is where the gas tax goes, to fund ferries and pretend that that's not going to impact roadway projects, um, including highway projects. I think it's it's uh, 
magical thinking to think that we could f- somehow fund ferry construction, ferry terminals, um, as well as you know improvements to local roads and bike and pedestrian safety projects. Th- those are all just going to be fine. That 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 you know I've heard Todd say that uh, well, bike and pedestrian safety just isn't a priority, and that that's just it's okay if that's defunded because that's just not a priority. Well, that's not what I hear from my constituents, but I do know that if you transfer hundreds of millions of dollars out of the highway account into the uh, the ferry construction account, that's going to have an impact on roads and bridges, including on safety. Backers of Initiative 2117 who want to end the Climate Commitment Act are framing the carbon marketplace as a government money grab. Brian Haywood has suggested that revenue is being used to basically bribe interest groups into supporting the CCA. He suggested in a Seattle Times editorial board interview that BP struck some kind of deal or even that there was a threat from the state to get the company to support the law. Um, He hasn't provided any evidence of that. We are going to be hearing from supporters of repealing the law this week, including Brian Haywood. So this may come up. What do you make of this allegation that there is some whiff of quid pro quo or corruption involved in the CCA? Well, I will try not to... um ascribe what his motives are in saying that so much as to say that I would stand by all the investments that we made with the Climate Commitment Act, whether that's investments in uh, forest health and reducing the, um, the the undergrowth that leads to, to wildfires getting out of control, to uh, repairing fish, fish passage barriers so that salmon are able to access more of their habitat, more of their spawning grounds, to our network of air quality monitoring stations, to um, uh, you know, investments in our ferry system. Um, I think all of those uh, investments stand on their own. That they're invested through our 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 legislative, you know, democratically elected legislature. As we as we develop the budget, you know, we hear priorities from members and we prioritize. We decide what what we can afford and what we can't afford in that given year based on what we think is is most impactful. One thing that we did this year is investments in uh, you know grants to. Uh, reduce food waste to help connect uh, farmers and uh, people in the food industry with uh, food banks and hunger relief organizations to make sure that not only does that food not go into the landfill c- contributing to climate change, but also gets to hungry people in need. I think that those are really meaningful investments. Um, you know, as far as the the yes campaign's allegations about um, quid pro quo, I just don't really know where that's coming from. It's certainly not what you know the the. Amazon, Microsoft, BP, Puget Sound Energy, you know, the companies that that have said this is a successful program that we want to see, you know, continue to work into the future. Um, I don't, you know, I don't know. I, I think their their statements about the merits of this program and why they have chosen to support it um, stand on their own. They're supporting it because it's the right thing to do and because they think it's more effective than any of the alternatives. Brian Haywood also said that he thinks we should do something for the environment, but he's not sure what it is. We should do we, we should get rid of this law and do something else for the environment, but he doesn't know what that is. Well, I would welcome hearing what folks think a better alternative to to, you know, what are other things that we can do to reduce pollution in our state? Um, you know, Todd Myers said, loves to talk about how he supported the revenue neutral carbon tax in 2016, which I also supported, by the way, but the, which this initiative would prohibit anything like that in the future. Um, so if there are other strategies that we should be deploying to reduce emissions that would that that initiative proponents want to talk about, that's great. But all they're proposing is eliminating what we've got, eliminating our cap on pollution, allowing unlimited pollution in our state with no suggestion of an alternative. In fact, prohibiting that we even adopt um, any alternative in the future. From my reading, it, it prohibits another cap and trade, but does it prohibit a carbon tax? Uh, I believe that it does, that it prohibits the, um, the it's it's indelicately worded. And so it's, it's you know, hard to hard to predict what a court would find. But I think as I read it, it would prohibit any kind of price on carbon. Um, you know, there was more than a decade of effort to try to get a carbon pricing system in the state. It started in 2009. I know you've been in the trenches a lot on this. So I'm not telling you anything new. But so listeners know, the legislature failed to pass a cap and trade bill a few times starting in 2009. There were a couple attempts, like you mentioned, the 2016 carbon tax initiative, another one in 2018. A number of political reasons why the 2016 one didn't get enough buy in the 2018 one. But, you know, for voters, they were soundly defeated both of these measures at the ballot box. Um, Finally, the Climate Commitment Act was passed in 2021. Do you worry that this was a fluke, that the legislature was able to get something like this passed and that now voters will look at this and say, oh, actually, no, we have historically not liked carbon pricing and we still don't like it. We're going to repeal it. 
No, because I look at the the coalition of folks who came out in support of the Climate Commitment Act when it passed the law into law in 2021. Um, wh- not just environmental organizations, but business organizations, um, you know, many of the businesses we talked about already, BP, Amazon, Microsoft, um, the Seattle Chamber of Commerce, uh, tribal governments, you know, who weren't really involved in those earlier fights, but came out in incredibly strong support, organized labor, very strong support um, for both passing the law originally, improving its implementation as we went along, and then make and then making sure that voters vote no on this harmful initiative this year. We didn't see that kind of coalition in 2016 or 2018. Those were there were, you know, very clear battle lines between the environmental voices and the and the pro business voices in our state then. Um, this year I think that there's a reason that you see, you know, very little active business support for the initiative because businesses the you know businesses operating in Washington State, I think first of all, want to see us have clean air and want to see us fight climate change. And second of all, they know that this is the most effective policy that's in our toolbox right now. Uh, And why would we throw it out and risk all these harms to our air quality and our forests and to our transportation system, um, knowing that this is working well? So you didn't see that kind of coalition in those previous fights. You also, one of the other criticisms of both of those initiatives, which I think was a fair criticism, was that they didn't guarantee the pollution reductions. Our law That's the problem with the tax, right? Because it doesn't have the cap to lower. I think that's one of the real assets of uh, of implementing a pollution cap is it guarantees that we're going to achieve the reductions that that um, that we know we need to achieve that our laws require that we achieve and that science requires we achieve representative joe fitzgibbon is the state house majority leader in olympia and he supports the no on 2117 campaign he would like to keep the climate commitment acts carbon marketplace in place Thank you so much, Representative, for being here and for walking through your position and the arguments to keep the Climate Commitment Act. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Libby. You're listening to SoundSide. And again, tomorrow we will welcome a supporter of Initiative 2117, Todd Myers with the Washington Policy Center. He'll be here to make the case to end cap and invest. This show is only possible because listeners support us. If you're able to give right now, please check out the show notes for a link to donate. And don't forget, you can listen live on KUOW 94.9 FM Seattle at noon and 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday or anytime online at KUOW.com. Org. Hi there, I'm Monica Guzman, host of A Braver Way podcast and your guide across the political divide. Are you done with the divisiveness in our politics and ready to do something about it? This season, we've partnered with KUOW to reach more listeners like you. Join me as I sit down with guests from across the political spectrum. Together, we'll share tools, insights, and messy real-life stories to help you face this election year without losing heart. Listen to A Braver Way now on the KUOW app or wherever you get your podcasts.